big anti-Semitism skipped a generation. I didn't experience this level of anti-Semitism growing up in New York. It was like, hey, Jew bastard. It was like that, which is just like some bully on a street corner. Just, but now? But now what my kids are experiencing, they really see the protests, like literally October 8th. You would think we'd have a, a, a minute of sympathy where the world would go, oh my God, I can't believe what just happened to them. And that's when they pounced on top of us. And when my kids saw that, and then the constant protests, globalize the Intifada, gas the Jews, they're, they're living in this new reality yeah. where they just woke up to, oh my God, the world is anti-Semitic. Hag Sameach, I'm Elon Levy, and welcome to this Purim special edition of State of a Nation. Jewish history teaches us three lessons. One, when people say they want to kill the Jews, you better believe them. Two, sometimes the whole world is wrong. And three, if the choice is between laughing and crying, then we choose to laugh. It's a lesson we learned back in the book of Esther. When Haman started plotting a genocide of the Jews, it's a good thing Mordechai and Esther took him seriously. They mobilized the Jewish world to fight for never again as Haman vowed again and again. They had to stand up to King Ahasuerus, who reigned over 127 provinces. You could call him the UN of his day. He passed a resolution against the Jews based on propaganda from a violent anti-Semite, and it took courage to tell him he was wrong and the Jews would fight for their lives to eliminate the threat hanging over them. And after the Jews achieved total victory over the death squads itching to destroy them, they made an annual festival to celebrate being alive in the silliest way possible. Not because the situation isn't desperate, but because laughter is the only way to keep sane. If you want to save the Jewish people, you've got to make them laugh. That's why my guest today on State of a Nation is comedian Elon Gold, here in Israel to entertain the troops and raise morale in a nation still shattered by Tent 7 and the ongoing hostage crisis. Together we'll talk about how humor can keep us going through tough times here in Israel during this awful war and in the diaspora where anti-Semitism skipped a generation, as Elon says, and is now back with a vengeance. The happy Purim and on with the show. Breaking news out of Israel this morning. Shocking hostage taking. Hundreds of Israelis are dead. I want to bring in Israeli government spokesman. Elon. What happens when a four-day course? How do you resolve this? Where does this go? You can't why? Elon Gold, welcome to this special Purim edition of State of a Nation. Wow, this is a treat. You know what a fan I am of yours. Of mine? I'm you, a fan of yours. No, the, listen, let's not play this mutual admiration society Elon Elon game. But in the words of uh, our former president, you know, you're doing so well, Elon. You're doing, I think you're probably doing better than anybody. And I know a lot of people. I know, I think I know more people than there are people. How many people are there? What, seven billion? I think now eight billion. Thanks to me, there's eight billion people. And you're doing better than all of them. Everyone else is doing very badly. They're doing so badly, horribly badly. They're doing, I think, worse. So now this is awkward because there's actually been a terrible misunderstanding. Why is that? When I told my team I want to bring Elon on the show, I meant the rich guy who owns Twitter. That's and, so nice. And, and I prepared all my questions for him, and now I'm going to have to come up with a whole new script. I will answer it as him. I don't do a him, though. I'm working on my, you know what I'm working on? What are you working on? I'm working on my um, Douglas Murray. Are you ready? He's been on the podcast. Let's have Elon Gold as Douglas Murray. Douglas Murray speaks very emphatically. And <laughs> one second. <laughs> and with authority. Now, I didn't say I have it down yet, but I will. Imagine being married to him. I mean, he's a, he's, he's a great guy. He's but great I'm guy. just saying... You don't want to get into a debate or an argument. You know, marriage, you argue yeah, a lot. I don't yeah. know if you heard. You haven't heard yet because you're still single. Yeah, thank God. Baruch Hashem. Baruch Hashem. Yes. And to all the ladies out there, huh, am I right? <laughs> uh, anyway. We're going to have to cut this bit out. Yeah. And some of the men. Uh, We're going to have to cut this bit out as well. There is no reason to cut any of this. This is so good. It's probably the best television in the history of television. Anyway, so, oh, Douglas, back to my Douglas Murray. Yes, episode three of Douglas Murray. Douglas Murray, if he was married, I think he is married, he would be like, dear, 
Get back to your side of the covers, of the bed. You're <laughs> occupying my territory. And I, he's just very intense, but he's brilliant. And I would not want to get into an argument with him. I'm not going to get any questions in this with every tangent that you go on. Not if a single one. If you've ever seen me, if you did your research and you've ever seen me on a podcast, yeah. it's basically it's basically Robin Williams is back. Of, oh, look at this. Oh, wow. Oh, what's this? We're, what is this show, by the way, called Between Two Ugly Plants? You know, I think you're going to be terribly late for the show you have tonight. If we keep I going have on 800. These here's how much I like you. How much? And I would even say love. I have 800 people waiting for me in two hours at yeah. a beautiful theater here in Tel Aviv. And normally at this point in time, I would be prepping. I'd be pacing and getting ready and getting new stuff in my head and like rewriting. And But I'm, I'm talking to you. The show will suffer as a result of this. But it will suffer for the sake of Israel's Hasbara. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. Let's, Let's get talk. into that. Let's, By the okay, way, so I look. like your when you said but. It reminds me of, uh, you know, Jeff Goldblum, the actor? Of course. He says but better than he was. Uh, uh, Elon Levy, he's good. He's very good. But, but he's also um, delicious. Yes, yes. Um, anyway, I can't, I'm not going to do any more impressions because we have to talk seriously, although it is Purim. Exactly. It's Purim, which is why we're going to have a bit of a gag. Look, I think that there are three lessons that Jewish history teaches us. Okay. I want to talk with you about one of them. First is that when people say they they want to kill you, you should probably take them seriously. It's so interesting that you say that. Can I say something serious for, for a it. second? I had this revelation recently where I remember 10 years ago, there was talk of these tunnels and the tunnels were going to you know, be used to kidnap and murder Israelis. And in my head, I went, well, that's never going to happen because Israel wouldn't allow that. They'll get wind of the tunnels. They'll destroy them before da da da. And then the worst of the worst happened. And I realized, listen to people when they tell you. So what is the lesson we learn from it? When Iran says, we're going to send a nuclear bomb here and kill all of you, listen to them and do something preemptively. But right before- This is getting very dark. We started on a funnier tone. When Hamas said, we're building tunnels to kidnap and murder, why didn't anybody listen to them? Anyway, let's get back to the comedy. So that's the first lesson of Jewish history. When yeah. people say they want to kill you. Yeah, uh, listen see. to them. Second lesson is that more often than not, yes, sometimes the whole world really is wrong. Yeah. And the third is that uh, you have two choices, to laugh or to cry, and therefore laugh. Yes, absolutely. That is, I mean, people ask me, how was uh, your trip to Israel? Because I was here uh, three weeks ago. Mm -hmm. We even had lunch together. Yes. And you came to my show. By the way, that was the worst moment in the show because I'm in the middle of a bit. He walks in, I walked rock in star. Late. I walked in late. late. The, the crowd goes nuts. <gasps> and I'm like, Only because you pointed me out. Well, I mean, I had to. And first of all, you know, you're, you're a legend. So I had to say, oh, look who's here. And they went nuts. And I was, it was like I was jealous. You know what I mean? It's like I felt like the, the ugly friend when you go out on a date and then like, you know, let's say we're both going on a date. Yeah. Clearly, you're more handsome. Together? Not together. No, not we're going together. out to okay. find a date, okay. right? And then these young women, they look at both of us. I'm definitely the ugly one. I'm older than you. I'm less attractive than you. And then there it was. In, in my comedy show, I was the ugly friend. No, I don't think that's I true. Was the but ugly I do friend. remember what you said there. You what said, did I say? You said, he's saving the Jewish people, yeah. but I'm making them laugh. Now, I'm not saving the Jewish people, okay? The people saving the Jewish people are the brave men and women down south, up 100%. north. But you're trying to make them laugh. And you said, and that's harder. Yeah. Is it, is it hard to make Much. Jews and Israelis laugh at this very difficult and traumatic moment? Or is it these moments of trauma that actually bring out humor because it's in those periods of stress that we use humor as a coping mechanism and, and so we laugh naturally? You lost me at, is it hard to make Jews laugh? And they're impossible. <laughs> Wartime, no war, best times, impossible to bring us that? out of our misery. <laughs> I always say Jews tend to hover somewhere between miserable and could be worse. That's our sweet spot right there. But, oh, quick story, by the way. See, we're all over the Is place. Is this another tangent? No, it's on point. You're going to be so late for your show. <laughs> I performed for uh, soldiers. 
And continuing, by the way, a long tradition of artists traveling around and entertaining. Yeah, it was like, like Bob Hope. Like I, like, I gotta tell you, folks. Like Leonard Cohen, who was Leonard here back Cohen, in 73. Bob, yes. How does it feel to be the modern Leonard Cohen? Well, uh, I wouldn't say that, but I would say that I did a li- this- I would. I'm allowed to flatter you now after Thank everything you. you've said to me. Well, this, this this woman came over to me at a restaurant and said, you know, I own the restaurant next door, and every Thursday night I feed soldiers. Would you come and speak to them? I said, of course. Do you, do you have a microphone? And uh, she said, yes, we'll get, you, we'll get you a mic. And I did it, and it was amazing because in the middle of this set, and I'm like, you know, I'm on, and they're having a great time. And I said, I just want to stop and be serious for a minute and say, and say thank you all for saving our people. And then, like, the commander of the unit gets up and he's like, excuse me, excuse me, wait, 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 wait. And that's what Israelis do, you know. I talked about that uh, in my act, where Israelis, they take a Hebrew word and say it eight times, and then it's English translation 15 more times, right? So it's like, lo, 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 no, 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 no. Eh, bo, 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 come, 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 come. Eh, bo, eh, bo, eh, bo, well, 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 well. Anyway, so he gets up, he goes, wait, wait, please, listen to me. We are not saving our people. We are saving all people. All That's profound. And I just went, wow, you're right. I wish the world freaking knew that. I wish the world saw what Israel is doing for everyone and thanked the IDF and thanked Israel because this horrific, twisted, inverted narrative of we're committing genocide. No, we're preventing genocide. So this guy got up and he goes, no, we're saving all people. And I went, you're so right. And I'm never going to say that again. You're saving our people. So the world should be thanking Israel. I'm thanking Israel because, you know, you're doing the, the the world's dirty work. Yes, we do feel we're fighting for humanity, and it would yeah. be nice if humanity appreciated. Wouldn't it that. be nice? It would be nice. Look, we don't need you to give us a pat on the back and say thank you, but understand that Israel is doing the dirty work it doesn't want to have yeah. to be doing. And and so the the troops you've been entertaining really understand. They have a very strong sense of mission and yes. purpose. How are they reacting when you come along and do your funny act? I mean, humor is the way that soldiers as well use to try to dissipate tension but yeah. they're in the most horrific circumstances well that's what you said tension and also for any show soldiers for you know anyone civilians uh comedy this is an old uh, uh saying it's an equation comedy is tragedy plus time right so you could take tragedy wait and then you do it now we're still in tragedy we still have hostages cannot believe that we still have i pray when this airs we don't um, but and that's why you're wearing this gold yeah, yeah, bullion yeah. around yeah, your neck. It's, it's not to remind to me off. that you're Elon Gold and not Elon no, Musk. No, 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 no. It's no. because it's one of the hostage dog tags that no, says on correct. it. Correct. He's Elon Bring Musk. Bring him home. I say he's Elon Musk. I'm Elon Musk. Do some corporate gigs to pay mortgage every now and then. But anyway, here's the thing: when you when when you have this tragedy, we're still in wartime. Yeah. And it it doesn't matter what's going on in the world. Everybody needs to have human experiences, eat, drink, laugh, sleep, whatever. And it is so important to take a moment. And I remember right when this hit, it was very much like 9-11. I not only didn't feel funny, like I can't be funny, but I was embarrassed to be a comedian. I was like, the world is so dark and serious and awful. I can't believe I'm a goofball and I tell jokes. How long did it take to snap out of that feeling that it's in about an hour and a half? About an hour and a half. No, it took a while. And uh, after October 7th, could not be funny for a couple of weeks. I canceled gigs and I said, I just can't do it. And I, I don't think it's appropriate to be funny now after what just happened to us. And um, then week three, I had these two back to back gigs. And the first gig called and I said, Are you calling to cancel? Because I'm canceling everything anyway. And they go, No, 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 no. Not only do we want you to, it's to emcee this event in this Beverly Hills Hotel, whatever, a thousand people, but we're asking you to be funny. And I'm like, oh, God, that, I, I don't know if I can. Like, we really need you to be funny. We feel like everyone needs to take a moment. And I got up and I said, we all know what's happening in the world, but we're going to take a momentary pause to have a nosh, a drink, and a laugh. And then we'll go back to the Because art. you need it, because otherwise you go insane. You go insane. And so what I do is, it's, so it's very tricky, you know, even segueing it or like opening lines. These shows in Israel, I love my opening line. You would have liked it too, but well, you I came late. It, yeah. 
Um, I get up there and right away I say, um, it's so good to be home, home with my fellow genocidal apartheid colonizers. Oof. And Tissing. everyone laughs and cheers because it's that release of, could you believe, oh, he knows that that's what they're calling us? Yeah. And we are the antithesis of all of those. There is no apartheid. We decolonized. There's no genocide. We're preventing a genocide. Well, there was an act of genocide, and that was October 7th. Correct. So, but calling them genocidal is the joke. And when you take something as serious as these ridiculous, absurd accusations that are that just fly in the face I mean, it feels like the comedy almost writes itself because the reality is I don't know about that. So I spent absurd. a lot of time writing this crap. <laughs> hey, these jokes write themselves. Yeah, tell that to me at 4 a.m., you know, up for three hours writing. But it does sometimes seem that the reality really can't be any more absurd When you say can't, really by the way, and I, I don't know how to say this delicately. If you say it, we're going to have to put an explicit warning on this episode. Okay, fine. So I'm not ratings. going to say it, but I want the people at home to realize that when English people say the word can't, they say can't. Like the German philosopher. Right. Like him. But also like something else that you're really not allowed to say in person, in public, Moving on TV. swiftly on. Yes. Uh, so do you find I can't. That, yes. Um, I'm Douglas Murray. <laughs> I'm very serious. <laughs> Uh, yes. Moving on, um, you've been here, you've been entertaining the troops, you've been entertaining You're on Israeli my side audiences. Of the bed. You're, <laughs> you've been entertaining the troops, you've yeah. been entertaining audiences who are living through the most horrific reality and are trying to find a way to escape yes. from the ongoing trauma of being over 150 days in a war yeah. with hostages still trapped in Gaza. Do you feel that you're helping heal? Trauma, is this just escapism so that we can get away from the awfulness of reality? Yeah, no, there's nothing I'm healing. There's nothing I can do to help anyone. It is beyond traumatic what we're all going through. And not just here, but on a global scale. It is shocking. And there's no comedy that can heal anything but give you just a moment of like, just a break. Take a break from the hell. You know, when people come over to me and say, uh, I lost my uh, parent and I haven't laughed in a year and it was so nice to laugh, that's healing. And, you know, they were mourning for a year and now they're laughing and it was their first laugh. That's different. This is, again, we're in the middle of everything and there's no... Do you think that Jewish humor has historically been that deflection coping mechanism, escapism, yeah, it or it's camps. a way of processing. It is a humor. way of everything, coping, processing. Because I mean, what, what then are your red lines? When you're writing a sketch, do you, and, and you're aware that you are writing comedy in yeah. order to offer relief in the darkest times. That's a good question. Do you I have, have jokes lines. that you can, because you say, that's too soon, that's yeah. too much, that's too sensitive? Not even too soon. I don't do Holocaust jokes. I just won't do them. And they're, they're, they're funny ones because that is the biggest tragedy ever. And again, you take a tragedy, you could turn it to comedy easier than not tragedy. But I will never tell a Holocaust joke. I wouldn't joke about the hostages. I wouldn't joke about rape. I wouldn't joke about families being burned alive. There's nothing. This is the most grotesque, barbaric attack that we've all witnessed. So I would never. And what is the comic material then? What related to the current conflict well, does give you material to say, okay, well, this is actually funny. This we can laugh about that is related. Perfect to the example. And by the way, Purim related. And I say, you know, I say on stage, here we are in Adar and, you know, Misha Nichnas Adar Marbim Besimcha, which means something, something Adar, something happy. That's all I know. But. We need it to means be. now that it's the month of Correct. Adar, we I know should it all be means. very so, happy. Okay, no, but joke. I want for our viewers as well, because they, they might not. Thank you. They might not. They might not. Yeah, these viewers don't know anything. They might not. I'm joking. Anyway, so the so what I say about Purim, I say Purim is a reminder that those who seek to destroy us get destroyed, and I, I don't know how people don't realize that when look at history. Doesn't Hamas know they're just going to be in our next Megillah, right? Don't, don't, don't they know there's just going to be like this amazing, awesome, brave Chayalet who takes out Sinwar, and then we're going to have like Megillat Miri. You know what I mean? We're going to be baking cookies in the shape of Sinwar's weird ears. Osnay Sinwar. Hamastashen, you could even call them. Hamastashen. Hamastashen. We're going to do that. So I, I, 
and and then from there you do joke. I, I do this whole bit about I'm not gonna do it here because it's weird to do comedy here, but about how we not Feel only free. we not only never forget, but we obsess. We obsess about our enemies. Like a thousand years ago, one Persian lunatic tried to kill us. Three thousand. Purim was three thousand years ago. Two and a half. Two and a half. It was two and a half thousand. Yeah, years yeah. Ago? Time flies. All right, I'll change that tonight. Yeah. Two and a half thousand years ago, one Persian lunatic tried to kill us. Thousand, we were in the Crusades already. Okay, fine. Nobody Too cares about your Crusade history jokes, lesson though. right now. I'm mid bit. This is why you don't do bits with someone else because they'll just correct you your historical inaccuracies. And what instead can I say? of like, this is a serious hey, podcast. hey, you're on the show. You're on a show with a mic, and there's a thousand people listening to you. They don't. The audience doesn't go. Three thousand. Three thousand. Three thousand. Two and a half. Listening. Anyway, as the bit goes, I go, and this one guy tried to kill us, and to this day, to this day, the mere mention of his name, and we're like, boo! Like, grown men are, like, holding these toy no noisemakers, and just, and you know that Haman is probably down there in hell, looking up at all of us, every Purim going, hey, real mature, guys! <laughs> real mature! Yeah, Ooh, that's great. How, what, what are you? How old are you, 40? Put down the toys. And by the way, I didn't kill any of you. I, get over it. Yeah, sure, I try. did I try? Of course I did, but not a one. Anyway, you do that on stage and it works. In here, not so much. <laughs> so what else are we going to see in Megillat Miri then, if we're talking about how this period is going to be written in the history books or rather in the history scrolls? It's very simple. It's triumphant over evil like the Nazis. And that's another thing I say. I don't get it. The world doesn't see that. They don't learn from history. And I say, do you not see? Because we're learning very well from our three lessons of history, right? Which ones? That if oh, the they say they're going to kill you, then you should probably yeah, believe course, them. But learn, more often than not, the whole world is wrong. And yes. you have two choices, to laugh or to cry. And I say, do you not see that the Nazis are not seen anymore? You know who is still seen? Jews everywhere in everything, in science, medicine, arts, culture, comedy. And like, they don't get it. But here was another thought that I had recently that makes me so sad, because I have four children, right? And these are the most beautiful, perfect, I'm sure, happy, I'm sure, yeah, okay, obviously. fine. Okay, yeah, yeah, This yeah, is okay, not fine. a parent speaking. I'm sure they're perfect. This I'm is sure, not okay, a parent I'm sure speaking. Perfect. This I'm is sure people perfect. telling me I'm sure how they perfect tell you. my children, children are. are perfect. And and they and they this this sad reality now that these happy kids are living in this time where they think the world hates them and they're right and i realized in my own childhood i didn't experience this level of anti-semitism big anti-semitism skipped a generation my father i mean his father two brothers two sisters mother and father murdered in the Holocaust. Wow. That's in Poland. That's his father's entire family. So he was keenly aware that they murder us, murder families. And your father was born in the States already? Yes. My grandmother said, we should get out of here. And like a year before, missed it. But his whole family was killed because they stayed. Mm. In the camps? Yeah. So I'm here because my grandmother went, let's go to America. And then, um, and it's crazy that my father knew about this and had this fear of like, wow, I have no uncles or cousins or anyone because they murdered us. I grew up hearing about that, but it's so far removed that I'm like, yeah, that's in black and white. To me, the Holocaust is in black and white. I'm living in color, baby. This isn't happening to me. And anti-Semitism that I experienced was so minimal growing up in New York. It was like, Hey, Jew bastard. It was like that, which is like, hey, fatso. Hey, real mature. Yeah, no, but it's the same thing. Like when someone just yells at you, like, hey, Jew or whatever, it's like, it's jarring, but it's not, it's not real anti-Semitism. It's just like some bully on a street corner. Just, but now? But now what my kids are experiencing when they see it online, the TikToks and on all that crap, they really see the protests, like literally October 8th, you would think we'd have a, a, a minute of sympathy where the world would go, oh my God, I can't believe what just happened to them. And that's when they pounced on top of us. And when my kids saw that, and then the constant protests, 
globalize the intifada, gas the Jews. They're they're living in this new reality yeah. where they just woke up to, oh my God, the world is anti-Semitic. And that's one of the things that drives me crazy now that many of the people attacking, not criticizing, attacking Israel, okay, trying to put pressure on Israel mm -hmm. to end this war in a way that leaves Hamas on its feet and abandons the hostages, couldn't even muster crocodile tears on October 7th in the best case and were glorifying, condoning it in the worst yeah. case. Like, ceasefire now people are out of their minds. Everyone wants a ceasefire. No, duh. We had a ceasefire and, and they've broken every ceasefire. Would you really call for a ceasefire if that was your child in those tunnels? No, it's completely gaga. I mean, the idea that we're going to abandon the hostages, which we won't, and I think Ever. any parent would go to the ends of the earth. Ends of the earth. Back. But also when they say, you know, we want a lasting ceasefire, permanent ceasefire, I'm like, well, congratulations. Like, there is nothing that we would like in this country but we'll more never... than the fighting to yeah. end forever. Of course. But we know that's not going to happen while Hamas is on its feet holding hostages, threatening to burn whole of families course. over and over and over they again. They break ceasefires by the day. And when they have a stated goal, and that's all they do, and that's all they work on, they're going to do it. I always say that this isn't, people call it a Middle East conflict. It's not a conflict. A conflict is when two parties are in conflict with each other. This is one party wants to live in peace and coexistence, and the that's other- That's us. That's us. For the record. No, yes. that's Hamas. Thanks for clarifying that. Well, I don't know. I have to make things extra clear. That's one of the first lessons of communication. You're right, by the way. And I'm not a communications expert, such as yourself. I don't know. You're a very good communicator. I'm all right. But the point is, and then you have this other side- Yeah, you're all right. That just wants that side dead. That's not a conflict. You know, Jeffrey Dahmer. That's Hamas. Yeah. yeah. Jeffrey Dahmer. No, no, it's important to be clear because in yes. this very topsy turvy world, apropos people think, think it's the other way around. Yeah. They think that we're trying to ethnically cleanse when if we wanted to ethnically cleanse, it would take about a half hour. And what about the two million Israeli Arabs that go and live their great life here in Israel? Are we killing them? We're not killing anyone. There are horrible, tragic casualties of war, a war we didn't start or want. That's such a difference than ethnic cleansing or a genocide. But anyway, Jeffrey Dahmer, mass murderer, this got serial, dark. Yeah. serial killer, murders people. Would you say that was a conflict? No. Right. Because it's just one murderous evil side and one side that wants peace and coexistence. That is not a conflict. That is just this one-sided insanity. And the fact that it's even called a conflict makes Israel culpable, as if uh, there's this back and forth, as, as if we also are, are, are a warring people. When the truth is, Israel has enemies. Oh, we know that. But Israel doesn't make enemies. Do you see that distinction? What do you mean? Well, it's very simple. Russia makes enemies. They go into Ukraine and attack this sovereign country. You just made an enemy, right? Israel doesn't make enemies. It doesn't go into countries and attack them. But there have been several countries who have attacked Israel. So it has enemies, but it doesn't make them and it doesn't want them. It just wants coexistence and peace. And you look at the Abraham Accords and you look at any deal with Egypt where we gave away the Sinai Temple, by the way, the Sinai Temple. I mean, Sinai like the Sinai Temple. Sinai that's, that's in my, we can that, keep that's the in Sinai my neighborhood, Temple. Sinai Temple. Sinai what Desert. a Freudian slip, that's right? Hilarious. You really hate going to shul that much. That's not true. That you just had a Freudian slip I about love, giving away the Sinai Temple. Do you temple. know that I go to shul every Shabbat? And do you know that what I... What do you want, a pat on the back? Yeah, I'd like something. Do you know that I put on... You can get Do you know that I put on tefillin every day? You're not going to get a medal. Even Shabbos, I put on tefillin. Kolokov, oh, yeah, that's, that's awesome. dedication. Um, yeah. That's dedication. I do, I do put on tefillin. <laughs> yeah, I do. And, and um, I did get an aliyah here in Tel Aviv. You know what was crazy? In my aliyah, it kept saying Zahav, my last name. Zahav, Zahav, Zahav. And then the last words of my aliyah that they called me up for was pure gold. And now we have a name for a comedy show. Yeah. Speaking of which, so you've been speaking to... But do you see what I mean? We don't... We have enemies, we yeah. don't make enemies. That is an important distinction. There are so many distinctions that the world, again, everything is topsy-turvy, everything is twisted. 
This entire world is so turned on its head. It's a fascinating distinction, and it's really one of the big challenges that we are coming up against because as we try to tell Israel's story and explain why we are fighting to bring back the hostages and make sure Hamas can never do this again and again, there is a whole machinery spreading these topsy-turvy lies about Israel that mm -hmm. are trying to create enemies for us when none need to exist. And then mm -hmm. we're appealing to the good, normal people in the middle and, saying, and, and then the we're not the bad guys. Yeah. It's the people who invaded it's on October 7th, crazy. burned whole world... families alive, and everyone taking their side yeah. with the bad guys. And so you talk about white colonizers. You might not like this one. White colonizers. I think you're talking about the British, not the Jewish. You've got the wrong ish. No offense. I know you're British. I'm also that, Jewish. And I know that Douglas Murray is very British. And a very good friend. He's a when I do an impression, do you know what they say? Impressions are the sincerest form of flattery. Yeah. Now, anyone that I've ever done an impression for, they hate it. Because if it's you that the guy's impersonating, it just feels like you're making fun of him. It feels like I'm making fun of him. If you were to do an impression, impersonation of me right now, it would definitely feel like you're making fun of me. That's an astonishing accusation. I don't, I don't really do it. <laughs> But anyway, the point is, when I would go on The Tonight Show with Jay Leno, I'd be like, oh, this is good. Yeah, about this. Uh, He'd be like, oh, do I sound like that? <laughs> you know, it's, it's like they don't like it. When I went on Howard Stern, Howard Stern was the only guy who liked it because I did an impression of him before he was famous, when he was just on the radio in like a few states. So he had me in, and it was very exciting. But the more famous he got, the less he liked the impression and the less he would have me in the studio because, again, he would just invite me, and I would sit down, I'd be like, uh, well, this is very exciting. Let me tell you something. This Elon Go, uh, this Elon Levy, he must get so much action. He's a single good-looking guy. <laughs> All right. Anyway. This bit will also be cut from the show. No, it won't. This is innocuous. Okay, I want to ask you a question. Yes. You're one of the few best American entertainers. Comedians who have come that have to ever Best lived. comedians who's ever existed. Yes, yes, yes. yes. You yeah. and Modi together. Now, you, yes. what, you've won the few, one of the few entertainers yes. who've come here. And we actually, are the number one and number two comedians. Exactly. Jewish comedian. Come to Israel and... Jackie Mason is and, not alive And, and you're going to let me finish my question. One. Otherwise, you're never going like to make Jackie it to your Mason show. Jackie Mason is a person that talks like this. It makes me nauseous to think that he thinks he can answer a question and ask a question at the same time. I'm Remember afraid Jackie about Mason? the next two people I'm going to mention because you're going to start impersonating them as well. One of the few entertainers who've appeared on Israeli comedy shows alongside Michael Rappaport. I don't really do it. Okay. And Brett Gelman. Mm. Uh, so you've been on Israeli TV. You were on which show? Zeuza. Doing an impression of? of? Of, you know, the guy that I did before. And I think I did it better than anybody. Um, it was a big hit, the sketch. And it was weird to be in makeup. And they take it seriously. It's like SNL. I couldn't imagine wearing makeup. Ah! He has a half of an inch caked on. <laughs> did they even powder my nose, which shines? No. Did they take away, I got three hours of sleep. Did they take away anything here? No, but he, they spent an hour powdering. It's this thick, you could, with a spoon, you could, and the whole, it's embarrassing. None of that is true. None of, no, we're gonna, none, none we're of gonna cut this. None, no, we're not gonna cut it. I'm just, I just will issue a flat denial. You don't know about true. my bit about the English and the teas. Oh no, it's I a want viral to bit. It's not you doing uh, an impersonation of a British person saying, "Can I have a cup of tea? Can I have a cup of tea?" No, because I'm not an idiot. I have great observations that no one else thinks of. That's when you, the good comedians have the good observations that are, you know, your first to the observation. And it, it, about the English, it was. Um, mm. The English have a weird um, relationship to letter T. Sometimes they overpronunciate the letter like that. And sometimes they ignore the letter completely. It's like, what happened? Where did the letters go? And there are two T's in the word letter, and yet they're nowhere to be found. <laughs> now he left. Um, going back to the question I tried to ask you show. five minutes ago. Um... You're behaving. <laughs> yes. Um, Do you understand how, what a great observation that is about the... About the English, do you, do you understand what a great observation that is? It's a is? terrific observation, really very profound. And leading on to my profound question. What was the question again? Which is to ask you, um, what are the differences you're noticing between Israeli humor and traditional American diaspora Jewish humor? I mean, do Israelis respond to the same jokes that you would do if you were giving, doing stand-up on the West Coast, in New York? I would say for the most part, just people are people. I was just in Zurich, Switzerland. 
um, a few days ago. And they were staring at me like this, going, what is he talking about? I don't get this humor. Is this humor? I don't, I don't see what this is. No, that's what I was nervous would happen. But the truth is, for the most part, it's in line with all audiences. But there's a specific Jewish humor and there's a specific oh. Israeli humor. So what is Israeli humor? Well, it's like there's a specific British humor. So Israeli humor, I would say, is even more aligned with British humor, where it's edgy, where it can get silly, you know? And American humor does that too. But it's more aligned with British than with American. That being said, at my shows, I don't know if they're laughing. Um, I don't know the, the composition or makeup of the audience and the demographic. How many are Israelis born here? How many are expats? How many are just made Aliyah and they're American, so they're laughing because they're American? But again, humor is universal. There are language barriers you got to overcome here. And, you know, uh, there are certain things that they just might not get. There are certain references that are totally American. That, But do you think Israeli humor is edgier and sillier? Is yes. there anything else that distinguishes it? You know what's funny about Israeli humor? It's not Jewish humor. It's not classic Jewish. It's not like Woody, you know, you know Woody Allen, you this is crazy. Elon has no idea who I'm doing because he's 12. How young are you? 32. You, so you're almost 12. I've heard of Woody Allen. Okay, so you knew who I was doing? Yeah. Woody Allen, Larry David, you know, Mel Brooks. That is Jewish humor. And Seinfeld and the show Seinfeld, Jerry stand up. That's Jewish humor. You know, what I do That's is, American Jewish humor. What's Israeli Jewish humor? Correct. Because we have a very different experience. Correct, but of... that's my point. Israeli humor is not Jewish humor. It's its own really cool, interesting, unique humor. But it's not Jewish, which is weird because this is the Jewish state. You know, I have a bit where well, I say... it's a different kind of Jewish humor. It's a different kind. I have a bit where I it's say... It's patronizing American. We're half of the Jewish world. It's as authentically Jewish as it gets. I, I have to Google patronizing. Anyway, so isn't that funny? Because you're patronizing. Anyway, the... Uh, here's the point. Israeli... Oh, I have this bit where I say um, Israelis are not Jewish. And I go, of course, obviously, I'm many, kidding. Many of the people in these protests around the world say, say the same thing. Do they? Well, yeah, that you're not real Jews. You're, yeah, whatever, uh, that's stupid. I'm yeah. just kidding. But my point is that I say there's a difference between Israelis and Jews. Israelis fight back. Israelis will return fire. Jews return merchandise. <laughs> it's a whole debate. Israelis, each and every one of them gets drafted into the service. Jews complain about a draft to the service. A waiter, is their event open? I feel something blowing on my shoulder here. There's just a different... Israelis are like, you know, they're sexier. They're athletic, by the way. They get into, uh, they get into like, Olympics, and they, they bring medals home, which is a big deal. Oh, yeah, global yeah. Global jury big on, and here. Big in judo. Huge. And, that and you get thing. medals. Jews, don't, we don't get medals. By the way, and I remember this is a true story. A few years ago, these two Israeli athletes won the bronze medal, so they lost. But they were treated to a hero's welcome back here. They got to meet with the prime minister. There were parades for these two losers. Imagine sitting on a float in a bronze medal, waving at thousands of people, these two Israelis. Like, eh, almost. It was uh, very close. Believe me, you don't know. We, uh, we had a problem. There was a problem. It was his fault. We, had, we missed it by a bumba. We had the... Uh, if you win the bronze in Russia, they put you to death. Are you just jealous again? You know, are you just bitter mid against? Bit, and he's mid a great mid. bit, and he's asking jealousy questions. No, I was, I was just going to ask whether you're bitter against bronze medals because your name is gold. Oh, that's funny. So you, you see, I was going somewhere with it. This great bit for a a four level out of ten of a of a joke. Do you want to do the joke again? If you win the bronze in Russia, they put you to death. You show up there like, hello, you just won bronze medal. How would you like to be executed? You win the bronze in Iran, they will hang you with your bronze medal in the center of Tehran with all the Persians walking by going, why they hang him? What, he gay? No, he won bronze medal. Anyway, 
I'm not going to do the rest of the bit. I realized, why am I doing stand-up sitting down? This is why you can't do stand-up sitting down. This is why you're just staring at me. Awkwardly. Is this over? Nearly. Okay. I want to show uh, just a clip. <laughs> I'll put you out of your misery soon. Um, I'm having a great time. I want to show, You're oh, not. I want, I want to show uh, a, a clip now, and I'll use this to plug the You're going to show podcast. a clip? I'm going to show a clip, and I want to use this to plug the episode on YouTube. What you're saying is you I were, should shut up for you, this. Because otherwise you are going to be so late for the show if you don't let me complete a I single sentence. You are worse, people Elon, waiting for me. You are worse than the, the record, BBC. You interrupted also you are a couple worse of than By the way, we're fighting like you are Douglas worse Murray than the most and whoever annoying he's married to. I've ever had. And you I left will, the toilet and seat I will, up. And, <laughs> You spoke at the United Nations. You tried to pull a couple of funnies in the General Assembly Hall, <laughs> poking fun at, uh, well, let's just watch and what you told these rather startled diplomats. What's up, the UN? I don't get to open too many shows like that. That's a, That was fun. This is so exciting. You know, uh, most comedians dream of playing Carnegie Hall, but it was always my dream to play the UN General Assembly Hall. This is, yes. I remember thinking as a kid, one day I'm going to be up there on that anti-Semitic stage. <laughs> Dreams really do come true, people. Yes, a lot of anti-Semitism in this room. I actually have to make this quick because I have a noon show. I'm doing a KKK rally after this. Some audible gasps. Yes. Yeah. Uh, how did they take that? Was that diplomats who were laughing? No. No. The room emptied out of the bad people. And then we brought in nice people, and it was Ambassador Danny Danone, mm -hmm. and he had this anti-BDS event, um, and he asked me to perform, and I was the only comedian, and still am, in the history of comedy and the UN to perform comedy at the UN. It was a weird thing to do, but... Um, if you were to go back into the lion's den of the United Nations, yes. now, over five months after the 10-7 massacre, with hostages still trapped, in Gaza with pressure internationally to try to end this war in a way that abandons the hostages in Gaza and leaves Hamas in power. What would you tell the diplomats who hadn't managed to take their coats and leave the room just yet? Well, isn't it interesting that I called out their anti-Semitism that's 10 years old? That's how long they've been anti-Semitic. If I was there today, I, I honestly don't- Not all of them, of course, disclaimer. Yeah, most. These are your words, not mine. Okay, fine. 60%? I mean, how many countries make resolutions against Israel? The singular obsessive focus Correct. about Israel at the United Nations as a way to try to blame Israel for all the world's problems and yeah. unite politically around a single cause, which is dunking on the Jews, definitely has some mild anti-Semitic yeah. Or overtones to it. Yes. The good news is the United Nations are irrelevant. Nobody cares. They're ineffectual. They don't. They don't affect any change. The UN is meaningless. It's just a building in New York, and nobody cares. Is this what you would tell them if you were to be invited back? Which, which I think after after, after that, that, if not think, after this podcast, yeah. you are definitely not getting invited wait, uh, back to the United Nations. Wait, are they are they getting anything done? Is the U what is the UN? Doing in the last I think I think I don't think that's fair. I think that UN agencies have done a very impressive job of covering up how Hamas is hijacking aid, covering right. up like how Hamas is militarizing uh, its hospitals right. and its schools. It's done a very good job of blaming Israel for things that are actually Hamas's fault. It's actually a very effective oh, you're operation. Being and I doff my oh, completely sarcastic. Oh, good. So you're with me on this. Why does it feel like we're always arguing? Um, I wouldn't be want to be married to you, Elon Gold. Thank you very <laughs> That's much. That's it. Oh my God! <laughs> and wow. on that note, I have to let you go so you can go yes. to your show and yeah. be entertaining. And you know, I think this was probably your best podcast. And I've looked at a lot of your podcasts, and they're doing well, but they're not doing very well. I don't know. The ratings are going to have to bear that out, and well, you, you will be competing ratings. with the most successful episode. I'll plug it again. Who? Douglas Murray, but oh. please not another impression. And that brings us to the end of today's episode of State of a Nation. If you enjoyed uh, this episode, please subscribe on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever else you get your episodes. And to everyone, a happy Purim. Happy Samir. Purim. By the way, if you didn't enjoy this episode, um, just follow me on Instagram. And there's so much better material than 
what this was. I don't even know. Was this a podcast? This was a podcast. This was, and you've just completely no ruined. Microphones. You've just completely ruined my ending. I'm gonna have Usually to film the, this again. Okay, no, this cut, is the ending. Cut. This cut, is the ending. Cut. Cut. Who, cut, cut what cut, could cut, be bit more cut. entertaining than this ending? We had a great. <laughs> we had a great rapport, I think. Right. <laughs> Our back and forth. That episode is going to have to be edited. No. <laughs> oh my God. Thank you very much.